Hello friends, I am Swapna Shetty. In this session, we are going to see the features of Java, JVM architecture, difference between C++ and Java, and parts of Java. So coming to the features of Java, Java is a very simple programming language. When Java was developed, they wanted it to be very simple because, because it has to work on electronic devices where less memory is available. So for that, they have completely eliminated the concept of pointers from uh, C++, which is very difficult for both programmers and learners. And next is Java people uh, maintain the similar syntax of C or C++ so that a person who is familiar with C and C++ can easily learn Java. And Java is object-oriented programming language. This means Java programs use objects and classes. What is an object? An object is anything that really exists in the world and can be distinguished from others. Everything that we see physically is an object. For example, every human being, a book, a tree, and so on. And Java is purely object-oriented programming language. Many reasons were put forward by many people saying that Java is not purely object-oriented programming language for reasons like in any purely object-oriented means it should contain only classes and objects. It should not contain any primitive data types like int, float, char, etc. And the second reason was in purely object-oriented languages everything should be accessed by objects. But Java contains static variables and methods which are accessed by you which are not accessed by using objects and the third reason was java doesn't contain multiple inheritance that means an important feature of oops was lacking so how can we say that uh, java is purely object oriented now no doubt java is definitely a pure object oriented lang programming language since even if java has got primitive data types those or primitive data types as are uh, represented as classes in Java, as wrapper classes in Java. And the keyword void is also represented as object of the class called class. Even static variables and static methods are written inside a class and those can be accessed using classes. That means those are never outside of any class. They are a part of a class. And moreover, any purely object-oriented language should follow all the five features of OOPS called classes and objects, encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. Just because Java doesn't contain multiple inheritance, we cannot say it is not purely object-oriented language. Multiple inheritance is not the main feature of OOPS. It is only a sub-feature under inheritance. However, multiple inheritance can be uh, achieved by using a concept called interfaces in Java. And Java is distributed. Information is distributed on various computers on a network. Using Java, we can write programs which capture information and distribute it to the clients. This is possible because Java can handle protocols like TCP, IP, and UDP. And Java is robust. Robust means strong. Java programs are very strong and they don't get crashed easily like C or C++. There are two reasons for this. First is Java has got some uh, inbuilt exceptional handling feature, an excellent exception handling feature, and also memory management feature. Like most of C and C++ programs crash because of not allocating sufficient memory or forgetting the memory to be freed in a program. Such problems are never will never occur in Java because the user need not allocate or deallocate. Everything will be taken care by JVM. JVM will allocate the necessary memory needed by a Java program. Next is Java is secure. Like security problems like uh, we have eavesdropping, tampering, impersonation, and virus threats. These can be eliminated or minimized by using Java on internet. And system independence. Java's bytecode is not machine dependent. It can be run on any machine with any processor and any operating system. Next is Java is portable. Like if a program, uh, if a program yields the same result on every machine, then that program 
is called portable. So Java programs are portable. This is of course the result of Java's system independence nature. And interpreted, Java is interpreted because Java uses both compiler and interpreter for execution. If you take any other language, only an interpreter or a compiler is used to execute the programs. But in Java, we use both compiler and interpreter for the execution. And of course, Java is has got high performance because the problem with interpreter inside the JVM is that it is slow. So because of this, Java programs used to run slow. So to overcome this problem along with the interpreter, we can we also use just-in-time compiler, which enhances the speed of execution of the programs. And Java is multi-threaded. A thread represents an individual process to execute a group of statements. So JVM uses several threads to execute different blocks of code. So creating multiple threads is nothing but multi-threaded. And scalability. Java platform can be implemented on a wide range of computers with varying levels of resources. Like it can be used from embedded devices to mainframe computers. Next is JVM architecture. So JVM, Java Virtual Machine, is the heart of the entire Java program execution process. It is responsible for taking the .class file and converting each byte code instruction into the machine language instruction that can be executed by the microprocessor. So this figure shows the architecture of the JVM. So first of all, Java, .java program is converted into a .class file consisting of byte code instructions by the Java compiler. This Java compiler is of course outside the JVM. So this dot class file is given to the JVM and there is a module called class loader subsystem which actually loads this dot class file into memory. Then it verifies whether the bytecode instructions are proper or not. If it finds anything suspicious, the execution is rejected immediately. If the bytes, byte instructions are proper, then it allocates necessary memory to execute the program. So basically, this memory is divided into five parts. That are those are called runtime data areas. Uh, the five parts of this memory are nothing but method area, heap, Java stacks, PC registers, and the native method stacks. So coming to the method area here, uh, the class code is stored. That is, code of the variables and code of the methods which are in the Java program will be stored in the method area. Next is heap area where the objects are created. And Java stacks are nothing but where these are the memory areas where Java methods are executed. While running a method, it needs some extra memory to store the data and results. So this memory is allocated on the Java stacks. Next is PC registers, that is program counter registers. So these are the registers which contain memory address of the instructions of the methods. Like if there are three methods, three PC registers will be used to track the instructions of the methods. Next is native method stacks. So similarly, Java methods are executed on Java stacks. Native methods, for example, C or C++ functions are executed on native method stacks. So to execute these native method stacks, we need uh, native method libraries like header files like stdio.h and so on. So these header files are required and these header files are located and connected to the JVM by a program called native method interface. And next is the execution engine. This contains basically the interpreter and the just-in-time compiler which are responsible for converting the byte code instructions into machine code. So why a just-in-time compiler is required? Generally other languages like C or C++ uses either interpreter or compiler to compile a program, to run a program. But here we are using both just-in-time compiler and the interpreter. So why both are required? Let us illustrate this point by using an example. Example, assume these are following are the bytecode instructions like print A, print B,
repeat the following 10 times by changing i values from 1 to 10 that is nothing but print so assume these are the uh, byte code instructions now the interpreter starts its execution from the first instruction that is print a so it converts this print a into machine code and gives it to the microprocessor let us assume that it is taking two nanoseconds for this now the interpreter comes to the second instruction comes back into the memory and reads the second instruction that is print b now it will convert this this into the machine code it is taking another two nanoseconds now interpreter comes to the third instruction that is which is nothing but a looping statement of print a now this should be done 10 times and this is known to the interpreter so first time it converts print a into the machine code so it is taking two nanoseconds for this now after giving this instruction to the processor it comes back to memory and reads the print a instruction the second time and converts into machine code this is taking another two nanoseconds so like this this looping statement will be repeated and totally time taken by interpreter to convert print a 10 times is 20 nanoseconds this procedure is not efficient in terms of time so that is the reason why jvm does not allocate this code to the interpreter it allocates this code to the just in time compiler now how just in time compiler will execute this looping instruction is first of all jit compiler reads the printer instruction and converts into machine code let us assume that it is taking two nanoseconds then the jit compiler allots a block of memory and pushes this machine code instruction into that memory for this let us assume it is taking another two nanoseconds this means jit compiler has taken a total of four nanoseconds now the processor will fetch this instruction from the memory and executes it 10 times so if we observe jit compiler has taken only four nanoseconds for execution whereas uh, interpreter has taken 20 nanoseconds for executing this looping statement so this is why we say that jit compiler increases the speed of execution so the first two instructions will not be allotted to JIT compiler by the JVM because JIT compiler takes four nanoseconds to convert each instruction whereas interpreter actually took only two nanoseconds. So what is the final key point is after loading the dot class code into memory JVM first of all identifies which code is to be left to interpreter and which one to the JIT compiler so that the performance will be better. So the blocks of code allotted for JIT compiler are called hot spots. So this is how the interpreter and the JIT compiler will work simultaneously in the JVM. Coming to the differences between C++ and Java. So C++ is not purely object oriented program. Whereas Java is purely object oriented programming language. So pointers are available in C++ whereas pointers are eliminated from Java. And in C++ programmer allocates and deallocates the memory. Whereas in Java JVM takes the responsibility of allocating and deallocating memory. And C++ has got go to statement whereas Java doesn't have go to statement and multiple inheritance is supported in C++ whereas multiple inheritance is not supported in Java and constructors and destructors are available in Java whereas in in C++ whereas in Java only constructors are available and coming to the parts of java we basically have three parts of java java standard edition that is java se java e enterprise edition and java me that is micro edition so java se it is the java standard ed edition that contains basic core java classes this is used to develop standard applets and applications whereas in java e it is the enterprise edition and it contains classes 
that are beyond SE. That is, we need Java SE in order to use many of the classes in Java W. So Java W mainly concentrates on providing business solutions to the on a network. And Java ME, that is micro edition, it is for developers who develop code for portable devices such as PDA or a cellular phone, where very where uh, it consumes very less memory. So that's all with the session. Thank you.